Hello everyone, boys and girls, ladies and gentle yams, it is your sweet Papa Yammy Noob. I'm here reporting live from the future in 2024. I hit warp speed on my Daytona 675 and propelled myself eight years into the future. How is 2016 going? Still mourning the loss of Harambe? I've got a sort of good news, bad news situation for you, except it's all bad news. Valentino Rossi retired and every motorcycle is made in China now. Oh my god, this thing is a cheap piece of crap. Okay, that's a little dramatic, but I think many riders can appreciate the sentiment. Looking at new bikes from Eichma, and they're all from CF Moto, Benelli, or a dozen new EVs. I mean, sure, Bomoto's making a supercharged adventure bike based on the Kawasaki H2, but we all know that won't have any significant impact on the changing tides of the industry. But I'm so happy that they're out there doing it. All that said, here are some cool new bikes coming out that soon your grumpy old EM is excited for, or at least new developments in the motorcycle industry. So without further ado, let's talk about five of the most interesting bikes debuting next year. Let's get into it. Woo, it is on like Donkey Kong, folks. Yamaha R1M giveaway coming at you live and fresh over on yamanoob.co. You thought we couldn't do it to you, but we're doing it to you right now and live. And just so you folks don't think I'm full of it, take a listen real quick. Ooh. <laughs> Go and get entered. The first bike on the list is the 2024 Ducati Hypermotard 698 Mono. You know I got that Ducati dog in me, so I gotta drop this Italian stallion right at the top. The 698 Mono is a new Motard Supermoto-esque motorcycle built upon Ducati's brand new Super Quadro Mono single cylinder engine. This engine is derived from the twin cylinder 1299 Panigale and proves to be one of the most advanced single cylinders ever produced. And guys, remember, when you're around Ducati simps, it's not single cylinder cylinder engine, it is a monocylinder engine. They're not V-twins, they're L-twins, so they're not singles, they're monos. So just keep that in mind if you don't want to be ridiculed by a Ducatista with a tiny coffee cup. This engine rivals many of the middleweight twins on the market, putting down 78 horsepower and almost 10,000 RPM and 47 foot-pounds of torque, but it can produce over 80 horsepower with a special exhaust, which is crazy. This bike evokes classic hypermotard style with an even leaner profile, weighing just 333 pounds before fuel. This this bike was actually awarded the title of the most beautiful motorcycle at Eichma this year, which isn't all that surprising considering the competition was a bunch of batteries with wheels. But all the same, the 698 is quite striking. I mean, it's a Ducati, what else do you expect? The fully adjustable 45mm Marzocchi fork paired with the lightweight steel trellis frame makes this bike equipped to handle like a dream in multiple applications. Apropos of its Motard styling, it's also equipped with a single Brembo caliper up front and Diablo Rosso Corsa tires. The Hyper Motard 698 Mono comes highly equipped with top-line electronics as well, and advanced ECU manages throttle action to prevent undesirable traction loss, wheelies, or excessive engine braking, which seem like things you want on a supermoto. The rider can choose from four levels of ABS control for cornering, with two options featuring slide-by brake functionality for consistent backing into corners on the Hypermotard. The engine response is adjustable across four riding modes, adapting to various riding conditions, whether it be a track day or urban hooliganism. The whole suite is controlled by a four-inch instrument display, the RVE trim comes with an up and down quick shifter and an exclusive graffiti livery. The Hyper Motard 698 Mono and 698 Mono RVE cost $12,995 and $14,495 respectively. Truth be told, I am very interested to see what Ducati does with this platform and this engine. I would love to see a lightweight enduro model or maybe even an ultra lightweight single cylinder racer designed to compete with the R7 and the Aprilia RS660. Now that would be cool. Kawasaki is bringing some new bikes to the 2024 model year, like the Ninja 500, Z500, and 450 Eliminator, which are all using Kawasaki's new 451cc parallel twin engine. And while each bike, specifically the Ninja 500, stand to keep the beginner bike segment competitive in the face of new offerings from brands like CF Moto, they aren't necessarily bringing anything novel to the segment. But as Kawasaki is releasing their beefed up beginner bikes, they're also building out many new electric vehicle technologies. While the fully electric Ninja E1 falls pretty short, short in many ways, while being incredibly limited in both range and top speed, their hybrid model, the Ninja 7, could be an interesting stepping stone for the future of partial ICE-powered motorcycles. The Ninja 7 is a true full hybrid, which means its hybrid battery, which powers an electric motor, is continually regenerated by the power from the engine, meaning it will never need to be plugged in or recharged. And this is a world first, so it's kind of cool. 
This electric motor works in conjunction with the traditional ICE engine. The Ninja 7 is aimed at the 650 middleweight class, although it uses the much smaller 451cc engine from the Eliminator, which is tuned and modified to make 59 horsepower. When the electric motor is activated to put the bike into e-boost, the Ninja 7 makes a peak 69 horsepower which is really nice. Essentially, this bike is designed to have a good amount of power on tap when you need it, such as for passing or getting up to speed on the highway, but conserve resources when that extra power just isn't needed. So for those of you that like rolling around with your R1 in first gear on the highway, this is not for you. But it is important to keep in mind that the power from E-Boost is limited to just five seconds, so the Ninja 7 is able to operate in three modes. The fully electric EV mode operates by using just the battery to power the bike. In this mode, speed and range are highly limited, maxing out a top speed of 40 miles per hour. There is also the Eco Hybrid mode, where the engine and battery work in tandem. In the Eco Hybrid mode, the Ninja 7 is able to get 76 miles per gallon, which is pretty significant for a bike capable of making power close to a regular 650. In the Sport Hybrid mode, you gain access to the e-boost function, where the electric motor adds functional power to the internal combustion engine for a brief 5 second window. The e-boost functionality is said to be quite enjoyable despite its limitations by those who've ridden it during initial testing. To power a motor motorcycle with both an electric engine and an internal combustion engine, the Ninja 7 uses an electronically controlled automatic transmission which can be operated in manual mode where the rider chooses gear position using buttons on the handlebar, which I'm not super fond of. That means the Ninja 7 has the same clutchless, unstallable approachability of other DCT or fully electric motorcycles. There's a lot left to learn as this bike continues to come to market, but I think it can be a worthwhile piece of technology to sustain the existence of internal combustion engines just that little bit longer. And I think the e-boost function can make the hybrid tech more attractive to traditional gearheads, selling the electric motor as a performance feature like a turbo or a supercharger instead of just an environmentally motivated implement. Ah. Suzuki, Suzuki, Suzuki. You don't do anything new for two decades, and now after developing one new frame and one new engine, you're just going nuts, huh? So we all know Suzuki came to the 270 degree middleweight twin game a little bit late with the Jixxus 8S naked bike, and now they're maybe a little bit too early for the parallel twin sport bike game. Or maybe not early, but right about on time. Bikes like the R7 and Aprilia R660 have paved the way for sport bikes that make torquey linear power and have a street-oriented naked bike with handling and style akin to a racing machine. These bikes have proven to be quite popular for those who want sporty ergonomics without the impracticality of peaky four-cylinder engines. Plus, these new grunty twin-cylinder engines are more in line with modern emissions regulations, which means they can be sold as new models as opposed to outdated bikes being grandfathered in. The Suzuki GSX-8R uses the 776 parallel twin developed for the Jixxus 8S, which they're now using in the V-Strom models as well. This engine configuration with its 270-degree firing order lends itself more towards a V-twin than traditional parallel twin like you find in bikes like the Ninja 650. Being a fully fared sport bike, the Jixxus 8R, which I'm calling it, uses a more committed riding position with sporty clip-on handlebars. The riding position similar to an RS660 finding a balance between sporty and aggressive and comfortable for around town riding. But if you look at the rider triangle, the Jixxus 8R looks pretty dang comfortable, not so sporty. Differing from the 8S, the 8R now uses non-adjustable Showa suspension in both front and rear. This bike is equipped with Nissan brake calipers and Dunlop tires. For added control, stability, and spec sheet appeal, this bike is using Suzuki's suite of rider aids, including three ride modes, traction control, a TFT display, and a quick shifter. This Suzuki GSX 8R is positioned just above the price point for the Yamaha R7, coming in with an MSRP of $9,439, which honestly is pretty good value for money. Typical Suzuki. KTM is on another level when it comes to making things unnecessarily extreme. What was once their middleweight naked bike, the Duke 790, then grew into the Duke 890 and has now become the Duke 990, which KTM has dubbed the Sniper. I don't know when KTM is going to give it a rest with these nicknames. What are they trying to do? Make callback to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria? What, you guys don't like history jokes? World War I, not your forte? Whatever. The Duke 990 may be an evolution of KTM's middleweight weaponry, but it features a wholly new engine frame and updated suspension components. The 2024 KTM 990 Duke boasts a recently introduced liquid-cooled 947cc parallel twin LC8 engine, delivering enhanced horsepower and torque with a claimed 123 horsepower and 76 foot-pounds of torque respectively. 
effectively. Notably, the engine incorporates more assertive camshaft profiles and extended valve openings. With tweaks to the frame and the swing arm, there have also been modifications to the seat and position of the foot pegs and shift lever, leaving this bike to have a slightly different riding position than the 890, which KTM hopes are positive improvements. The Duke 990 has fully adjustable WP Apex suspension as well as new wheels, with most bikes from KTM coming with incredibly competitive tech packages. The 990 is no exception. It has a redesigned TFT display with ride modes, supermoto ABS, and traction control. Optional ride modes allowed for more in-depth customization. The Duke 990 also comes with a demo mode, which will allow access to the optional performance and track modes, as well as the quick shifter for the first thousand miles of ownership before deciding to purchase them or not. Kind of interesting, but that is just the digital paywall structure we live in now, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. The Duke 990 is unmistakably a Duke with sharp angles and bright orange paint. This updated machine has an MSRP of $12,500. And the last bike I'd like to talk about today is the new Royal Enfield Himalayan 450. While this bike isn't a crazy hyper naked or boasting innovative hybrid tech, in an era where many companies are investing heavily in new and approachable motorcycles for beginners, Royal Enfield had to step up their game. And the new Himalayan sporting a liquid cooled engine stands to be a clear stepping stone for the future of the company as they realize they can't stand on the shoulders of lumpy air-cooled P-Twins forever. Maybe it's due to the fact that I had the chance to ride this bike in the actual Himalayas. Go and check out those videos if you haven't seen it yet, but something about it has stuck with me. The new liquid-cooled single-cylinder engine makes 40 horsepower and 30 foot-pounds of torque, which is a substantial improvement over the former Himalayan models. This is truly the first wholly modern bike to come from Royal Enfield. It has ride-by-wire throttle, which is okay, TFT display, and switchable ride modes. The throttle is a little wonky and lags when first opened, but the Himalayan was always kind of a donkey and is probably going to take a little bit of upgrading and fine tuning over the coming years to fully breed the mule out of its DNA. The Himalayan 450 is quite sure footed on both pavement and some gravel roads, living up to its storied versatility. This new bike from Royal Enfield really is an impressive departure from their archaic roadsters, and I really am excited to see the way they continue to make the beginner bike segment move and become more diverse and competitive. US pricing hasn't been confirmed at the time of writing this, but it's estimated to cost between $6,300 and $7,000. What bikes are you? most excited about to see this coming year? Should we pay more mind to the new influx of electric bikes? I really don't want to talk about them, to be honest. Will Chinese motorcycle companies put us all out of business? Be sure to subscribe if you want to be the first to know. Thanks for watching, and I will see you later. Fact, the total weight of ants on Earth is estimated to be roughly equal or even surpass the total weight of humans on Earth. Goodbye. Keep watching Yammy Noob!